quickly when I pause the recording. There. So hopefully you can see the screen now. Uh, let's see. Uh, wait a minute or two to see if people get back. I know there were like five or six people. Uh, can you folks see the screen? Let's see. Here comes a chat message. Ah, good. Okay, great. Okay, good. Thank you for telling me. I assume it was probably when I stopped the recording briefly, somehow it terminated the share. You got to let me know. That's one weakness of my amateur hour uh, video presentations here. I don't have any way to see what you're seeing. All right. So, all right. So, uh, you have a, a web server, and this a normal old fashioned web server just has web pages and serves them up to people and come here on a browser. And you can do that, but now you do much more typically. You have an API. So you send requests up to the server with parameters in them, and the server gives you data back. For example, Google Maps. You can, if you bring up Google Maps, like here, it shows you where you are. And if you drag this across the screen, the map moves. Now that is a very advanced process. That does not happen by reloading a whole fresh page from the server the way it used to. But this does terminate the uh, down part. So what this does is it, it sends a request to the server saying, I want a little bit more of the page. If I can get this junk off my screen. All right. So when I drag it to the right, it says, I want a little bit here, like another half inch on the left. So it sends a request to the server telling it where I am and how much I want, and it gets a little bit more data and a little bit more data. There's a whole stream of requests going up to the server and coming down, and those are using the API. That's the application program interface, and this is how most modern web pages work. They have not just a list of files that you can download or view. They have an interactive component where you send up requests asking for specific kind of information, and it responds giving you the information. So that's the issue here, and the problem is these things are often sloppily written and have command injection. So here, for example, is one from a web server where it's got a Perl script on the server, and the point of this is a, an administrator can check a directory to see if it's full. And this is something you might do if you have something like a blog platform where users can upload images, and each user has only so much space, and you want to have some kind of command whereby a user can be told if they've used up all their space. But the way it was implemented, of course, is to use the du command, which is a Unix command to tell you how much disk has been used in human readable form. And then it uh, adds to the end of that command the dir that came from the user. So it takes user input and puts it in a line of code and then executes it in the shell. This is like the ping form in the first project you started here where you make a, bash, a command line command using data from the user. And of course, that means the user can inject other commands by, so if they put in slash public at the top there, at the end of that URL, then they just get a list of files in the public directory, which is the original intention of the form. But if they then put in a pipe and put cat at's password, they can see files they aren't supposed to see because you have just a line of command line. And you can add more commands into that line, just like you did in the first project. So that's, um, that's typical command injection. And this is quite common. Um, there was an open view had another one of these that was vulnerable to essentially the same thing. There was a thing called a node and you could just put in a pipe and add another command. You saw the um, image magic. You did on that one, I think in the projects too, where you can just inject more commands and this keeps coming back over and over again. And there was a news article, which I didn't see where you're going through the news, but there was a news article just today about another library with an injection like this. Although I was just talking to Caitlin about it before class, it's kind of a contrived situation. But there's a situation in which you can cause a web component to load a library from a remote server. And then you can just add library code to the thing while it runs. Um, anyway, so that's, you can also inject into Microsoft servers, of course. Here's ASP making a string name that is going to do the same thing. It's going to uh, refer to the location of something with a directory file name that came from the user. So again, you've got command slash c dir, and then a directory name came from the user. So it's just going to have a command injection in a Microsoft environment. Works just the same. What is SP is Microsoft Search Observer Language, Active Server Pages. It's what they use instead of PHP. It's Microsoft imitation. It's yeah, yeah it's, it amounts to about the same as PHP really in practice, but it runs on Microsoft web servers. Um, you can also put PHP and Python on Microsoft servers, but it's kind of weird and not that common. What most people do is run the Microsoft equivalents, which is ASP. Anyway, and, and uh, things like uh, Visual Basic. 
So here's the page that lets you view the contents of a directory. You put the directory name in here and you see the contents. But if you put in the directory name ampersand ampersand IP config, then you get the IP config information, the IP address, because you can just add more Windows commands there. Um, all right, and PHP, of course, has the same thing. You have a search, then you're going to search into a directory, and um, it's going to use this eval function. This happens a lot in PHP. People use the eval function. And the eval function takes the information from the user and runs it as a command line command. I often use os.system in Python. It does the same thing. These are very dangerous commands to use and very convenient. So if you just don't care, you use them like me. And if you're sloppy, you use them because it makes it easy to write certain things. Yeah. OS.system is different than eval. Eval is just for executing PHP code, right? OS. Yes. OS.system system is Python. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. OS system in Python runs a runs like a bash command. Yeah, right? yeah. So, but eval does not run shell commands directly. It runs. Oh, it just gives us PHP. Yeah. Good. Okay, thank you. So you, you could inject PHP, but not shell. Thank you. But, but you, could, you could add a you know um, a shell exec command. Yes, you could. Yes, but that's but thank you. I appreciate it. That's a very good point. All right. Anyway, so um, if you want to find these things. You just try adding special characters, typically, like semicolon and ampersand and such, in every place you can put in data to see if you can get something to work out. Um, a backtick is in a Unix environment, backtick causes immediate command execution. Uh, if you put a backtick around something, that means execute what's inside here as a command. But these are various in, um, injections. Now, remember, I've talked about this before. If you run a command on a server in a command injection environment, you very often do not see the results because you typically confuse the application and the output does not produce something it understands. So you get something like a 500 delay, a 500 error. And so you may have to use the blind injection technique to, to find it, like run something that takes time like a ping, or you're gonna have to make a network connection out with Netcat or something to see whatever you have done on the server. Or redirect the output to some file you can look at later. You know, this is a very common problem that you have some ability to execute code on the server, but you can't see what you're doing. Um, NSLOOKUP, here's another app. So the app passed the user in data to NSLOOKUP, so you were putting in something like a domain and it was then going to do something like test that domain or something. So it blocked ampersand and pipe, so you can't just add more commands, but it didn't block greater than. So you could take the NSLOOKUP and redirect the output to a file. And then you could make an error message that includes the domain name. So here, you put script code in here, and send it to a file, it puts an error message in the file saying server can't find that, and now you execute that file. Um, this is, there's a series of vulnerabilities also where you execute the log file. You have a log of some kind, you redirect the log to a file which becomes executable, and then you can make a shell. Um, if you're able, for example, to redirect this to a PHP file, then you could run it because the PHP extension would cause the PHP preprocess to interpret it as an executable file. And this, you know, this gets us to one of the many great weaknesses of the web. But there, I mean, there's two fundamental weaknesses that lead to all these things. The fundamental weakness that leads to all these web vulnerabilities is that there's no way for the server to tell real commands from data. There's no fundamental difference. And this is the fundamental reason why all um, memory corruption exploits work is that the servers don't know what they're doing. Everybody's the same. They can't tell a byte of a password from a byte of executable code from a byte of an image file. And in a retrospect, if someone were to ask me, I would say, why don't we just make every byte like 12 bits long and have four bits in every byte that specifies what it is to tell us if it's code or text or something. But nobody's done that. That's not where we are. And the lack of that means you can constantly trick the machine into misunderstanding what you're saying. Um, so if you want to present these things, of course, don't use these dangerous commands that call the operating system directly. If you have to, then filter them with whitelisting and so on. The best thing is passing, um, use APIs that are written in a way other than taking user input and building into a line of command. You should take user input and compare it to a list of known good values and pick the known good value or something like that. Um, don't pass user input into dynamic functions, but it is very convenient. It's often the easiest, fastest way to write code. I do it all the time on my servers that are intended to be hacked. And, uh, that's the usual game. So another variation of this is file traversal and file inclusion, where you're able to insert files where files should not be or redirect files to refer to files that were not expected to be included. So here's a function that displays a file in the browser, get file.ashx, which is I think, a, I think is one of the ASP variants of Microsoft thing. 
is going to look, post, get this file called cura.jpg. So if you can put a dot dot backslash in front of it, that will go to the folder above where you are and you can navigate around. And in the book, they're using this win.ini file, which is a file that was just present in all Windows operating systems, at least through XP, maybe Vista. Doesn't do anything anymore, but it's there just like slash etc slash password is in Unix. It's a file that's readable by everyone, and therefore it's a simple way to test to see if you have the ability to refer to files that are not appropriate. So you may be able to read or write to files, so you might be able to read passwords or logs or overwrite things like system binaries or config files. And there are file system monitoring tools to prevent this. Uh, you can use FileMon, or I think SysMon for that matter, or even Windows File Auditing. There are various ways to put entries in the event log when people mess with files on Windows. Tripwire does it too. Um, you, can, you can or use Ltrace or Strace. And there's trust if anybody is still using Solaris. I don't know how many people are still using Solaris. Probably banks still are. Anyway, so path traversal. Um, if you want to detect this, just put in some unique string and then filter to see if any of these things appear in a eject this thing everywhere you can put it with special characters and then see if a file is created with that name in it somewhere. That would be a simple way to do it. Or opened with that name in it. So here's a successful path traversal attack. Dot, dot, backslash, dot, dot, backslash, windows, win, dot, any. So they were able to see this windows configuration file, which they should not be able to see. So if you want to um, get past to some degree of filters, try both forward and backslashes. They often work, especially on Windows systems. I think honor either one. A URL encode these characters where you might get past filters. Um, there's 16-bit Unicode, double Unicode, overlong UTF-8 Unicode encoding with multiple bytes. There's many ways to encode these characters. And if the... Um, Various systems will make various errors, causing these encoded versions to be misunderstood by the filtering stage and understood correctly by the processing stage, especially when the filtering stage is completely different than the processing stage, which is extremely common because people have a web server and then they buy something like a web application firewall, which is a totally different box from a different company. And so the filtering stage is very different than the actual stage that uses it. And so, uh, these overlong Unicode are technically illegal. You can also try these sort of things, which are one dot dot slash embedded in another dot dot slash. And the idea is that the filter removes one of them and you have one left. We had one like it last week where you have the word select and you put it inside the word select. So if someone's trying to remove the word select, they'll end up creating another one. Uh, there's also null characters. If you have the ability to upload images, but you cannot upload any files, you can upload a file any null byte dot JPEG. And if a code written that ignores the null byte will see this as a JPEG, code that sees the null byte will see it as an INI file. Uh, this is like the, one of the um, Pony Awards about eight years ago was given to the GIFR. It turns out that a GIF has no footer, but it has a header. And a JAR has no header, but it has a footer or else it's the other way. So you can make a file which is absolutely a valid GIF image and it's also a valid Java archive. So the same file will pass all tests as an image when you upload it and it will also execute in Java as executable code. So that's, that was a big hit when that came out and that's another way to do this, to upload something which can be interpreted as an image or can be interpreted as executable code. The null byte will be seen as a terminator of a string in C, and some languages will accept it. So you'll sometimes get away with this and sometimes you won't. They're all sort of shots in the dark. So you, if you can read things, you'll find password files on there, configuration files, include files. Many, many people put credentials in their source code, pass user at AMI uh, uh, keys to log in and so on. Uh, databases, log files may contain too much information. It's a big deal. If you stop, in the purple contest, we're doing a lot of Splunk and I have a Splunk class been going on this semester. One big thing in Splunk is permissions. Your logs frequently contain sensitive information that nor other people shouldn't see and you limit who's allowed to see the logs. So being able to read logs is often quite valuable. Uh, if you can write things, of course, you can create scripts that will be in user startup folders and will run when that user logs in. You can modify other things like FTP daemons to execute code and so on. Um, put up 
write scripts and execute them like PHP shells. You know, if you can write, you can do a lot of things. If you want to prevent these things, it's all the same thing. Don't take user controlled data and put it directly in a path anywhere. Just like you wouldn't put it in a command. It's much better to force the user to just choose from a list of known good inputs than to take their text and put it in something that's interpreted as a command line. Um, if you do have to have defenses, then you have to make sure it's after all translations, all decanonicalization, all decoding, so the, and after it's all done in coding, then you can look for these bad characters. Um, in general, this is the step that seems to be always skipped. If you have a problem, don't keep going. Don't just pass the supposedly cleaned up data on to the next process. Just reject it. Go back to users saying something's wrong with the input. That would always be much safer. But there's an enormous number of people that just sanitize it and keep going, which I suppose is probably because they suspect that this bad data is not really from a malicious user, but from some other server in their complicated web app, which is misconfigured by some other administrator and it's too much bother to tell them to clean up their code. Um, this is when Microsoft Windows 2000 source code leaked out, there were a lot of embarrassing profane comments in it. And one of them was this guy that wrote, now I have to add 2,500 lines of complete shit because Microsoft driver team can't be bothered to format their data correctly. And this is very common. I had to just, I seemed to be like I spent most of my time and I was a database administrator taking data that came in in a messed up format and trying to reformat it to get it all the way in correctly. It's, you just get used to doing it all the time and you don't think twice about it. Anyway, um, so you've got a canonical path here is a, one of the APIs in Java that will do this. Here's an ASP.NET. These are things that will hopefully give you the full path that is actually going to be used. So you can check to see if that contains forbidden characters. Um, you can also put your app in a controlled context. If the Android environment, we talked about this a lot in 128, um, every app runs in its own user account in its own home folder. So the app cannot reach anybody else's files. And that's root jails are another way to do it. If you can, in a Linux environment, you can take a folder and move the entire app to run in that folder to where all the other things it uses, like operating system commands, you have a separate copy in that folder. It's like, a, before there was virtual machines, there was Sharoot. You would copy some small part of the operating system into a folder, and then you'd run the app in that folder, and that's what it would see as the root. So it could not refer to anything above it. That's a simple way to isolate processes. In Linux, it's been around forever. In Windows, you can do the same thing. You can map a drive letter to a folder, and then, makes the app refer to only things with that drive letter. So it can only see that high and no higher. Of course, these are not perfect, just like the Android. All this means is they can't get out unless they can get root access. And then they can get out because then they can use the direct physical path to refer to the hard drive directly and break out of the mapping. But it does stop them. It just forces them to have a privileged escalation to get out. And that is about all you can ever do. Um, Yes, you can also have rewrite permissions and so on. Yeah, that's right. These are all ways to limit what an app can get you. I know. Yes, that's right. Yeah, they're they're all they're all based on the operating system enforcing these defenses. All right. Um, and of course, again, you should have logging and alerting systems connected to these, so hopefully you detect people breaking out. Another, uh, people are using, all using containers now, and there are a bunch of people escaping from containers. They're using Kubernetes uh, orchestration platforms to roll out these containers, and people are breaking out of those. And they're using virtual machines, and people are breaking out of those. In the general accepted wisdom is that virtual machines are more secure than containers, but in practice, they all have their limitations, and there are ways out of all of them under certain conditions. Um, and then there's file inclusion. So you, in order to, not waste your time rewriting code. Every company has a repository of code they reuse over and over and over. Everybody does. I've recently upgraded my CTFs by having one CTF engine that I include all over the place. You know, everybody does this. It's the efficient way to write code. But what it means is now all your code is not in one file. Your code is fetched from someplace else. And therefore, you might be able to inject code from the wrong place. Uh, this is like dill injection in memory. You can do it. And so here, um, the country comes in in a parameter, and the, the, um, the country is put in a file, include country.php. So they have a whole bunch of files, us.php, uk.php, canada.php, and so on. So the injector, the um, attacker can inject evil code there, where it connects to some remote server and loads the code from there. And that's exactly what the vulnerability that came through the news today was. 
you could load library code from a network location instead of from the local server. And that's called file inclusion, where there is some parameter that's supposed to point to a file in a certain directory, and you're able to redirect it to point to some other directory and fetch the file from someplace else. Um, so that's called local file inclusion if you load another file from the same server, and it's called remote file inclusion if you can load files from another server and put it on there. And they're both quite dangerous. Um, so if you want to find these things, just insert like URLs into web server in every parameter or non-existent IP address or a malicious script or something and see if any of them load. There are ways to, to find these in automated ways. For local file inclusion, you can point to a known executable on the server or uh, try traversal to another folder. You know, you just try various versions of it and you can write scripts or use a vulnerability scanner that will try an automatic test of these types. So I've got some cahoots about that. Let me bring them up. I went and found purple pictures. That's all I had. There's my cahoots. Life is good. This is 129S 10A. All right. Good. I should make a place to put winners. Few people. Guess I'll wait a few more seconds. Make it a little bigger. All right, let's give it a shot. So, which one will let you add malware from a different server into somebody's web page? Yep, that's file inclusion. Very annoying. You will then get busted by antivirus engines as having malware on your page when you don't, because someone's able to give the user the experience of hitting your page and having malware on it that didn't really come from your server. Well, which one puts the web server in a restricted file system? That should just be Procmon. All right, it's Sharoot. That Sharoot shouldn't be there, but anyway, it's a wrong answer. So Sharoot is what does that. All right, what defense detects file system modification? Okay, that's Procmon, process monitor. We use it in the malware analysis class quite a bit. And what vulnerability is often caused by eval? All right, that's command injection. Uh, eval is begging for it. All right, so the winners, Mateo and 3T will have to tell me who they are. All right, anyway, all right, so let's carry on. We have time to just keep going, I think. So um, XML external entities is just another system. If you have an XML page, and there's a lot of XML databases and other things that use XML processing, um, Ajax in particular does it. So this means you have, it's just another way of formatting data. So your user will send up a request like this. They're gonna send a post request with 44 bytes of content but the content is XML, which means it has these HTML looking tags, search, search term, nothing will change, and search term, and search. It's just another way to format data going up and to format data on the server. 
And if that was all there was to it, it really wouldn't be any different than anything else, except you'd have a different special character to inject stuff, but it allows some other fancy responses. So if you send something up, the server will now reply something that includes that. No results found for this expression. This is what a typical search engine might say, sending it back to you in XML format. So the problem is, the way this is handled on the server is they run an XML parsing library to interpret the input, and they just get standard libraries that meet the standards, and the libraries include extra features that the developer might not have wanted. And in particular, they support XML external entities. XML libraries allow you to define your own variables. So you can define a thing called an entity, test ref, which has a value. You can sort of like shortcuts, you can define things. And you can find things that include active code. So um, this will take, you can define something called XXE, which is gonna be a file referring to another file. And now when you, if you put that in your search engine and then the reply has that in it, it will be taken by the XML parser on the way back and replaced by the contents. This is very much the same thing as a PHP shell. You make a file which just contains PHP code, but when the Apache web server serves it, it says, oh, this is executable code. I better replace it by the, I better run this and put the result in there. And the XML parser does the same thing. When it sees this entity, it says, oh, I better run this command to decide what goes in that entity. So you'll see the contents of that file here. So that's uh, just another situation. I remember, boy, I remember, when I started this 20 years ago, a bunch of people yelled at Microsoft and they said, Microsoft is a bunch of bums because Word documents contain both code and data in the same file and Linux people would never do anything like that. And they do it all the time. All these things are mixing executable commands in with data all the bloody time, which is just as dangerous as everyone said it was. The only part that was a lie was saying that there was anybody that didn't do that. Anyway. Um, so you, this one will connect to an email server. It will do a system connecting to a remote server on port 25. And so uh, this one is a denial of service attack. It will now try to put in data from the dev random device. And the dev random device creates an endless string of random bits. So it will never stop spitting out junk now. Um, you can yeah, scan. Another file to kind of update the entity, right? Uh, uh, you could, any, any, if you pass it through any XML parser, you can do it. I mean, another web page? Yeah, yeah. Any, yeah, any XML based system will typically have this vulnerability unless you find a way to turn it off. So I mean, you define the entity and you have to have another to run that entity, right? Yes, if you were to have actually fetch stuff from another server, you'd have to actually have that content on a server to use this correctly. If you were to do something like this, where you connect to another server, it will try to connect, and all you're gonna have is a time delay while it fails to connect. But you could, for example, port scan from here by just putting in a whole series of these with different addresses, and you could tell from the output what servers are there. So this is one way to pivot into a network. Anyway, I'm not sure I understood your question. Anyway, let's, all right, so then there's SOAP. SOAP is Simple Object Access Protocol. And so SOAP is just another way to move data up. And here, in the post part of the URL, you put data the way you might have put it in the get part of the URL. And remember, in the get part, if you were to just get a page, you'd have Q equals query, amber, next brand, just put it like the name equals value, ampersand, name equals value, and so on, just in a string. That's simple object access protocol. And you can do it that way. So here's a bank account where it takes the from account, the amount, and the to account, and then it says submit. So this will make a request for funds transfer. Now on the server side, it will then send a SOAP message formatted like this to go to another server saying, I'm trying to go from this account to that account, but the funds have not cleared yet. It's false, meaning you have not yet verified that the money exists. So you send a request like this, and the server, this goes to some server to test to see if the transaction is possible and it will reject it because you are not logged in as that user or the funds aren't really there or something. But if you, the point is this, this is the same fundamental problem. You have a server 
which adds this tag into it, and it doesn't really know whether you have the money. It just looks to see if that tag has been put there, and it assumes that only the authorized apps could put that tag there, and that is, of course, not true. So here's a normal SOAP message, but if you use this amount, if you're able to inject special characters into the amount field, which ought to just be numbered, and you're able to inject all that red stuff, then the resulting SOAP message will look like this. It adds the cleared funds tag, and it uses comment tags to get rid of this missing stuff. So the end result is you now have a correctly formatted SOAP message, which transfers money from one account to another and says it's cleared. So that's uh, an example of how to do it. And that will uh, result in performing the transfer. So it is not perfect. The end closing tag in this case is never the end a comment tag is never closed, so some processors, XML parsers, will reject it, but other processors might take it. Um, so if you want to find this, of course, just try injecting all these funny characters, try injecting slash foo, because if you have XML, you're supposed to have a foo tag, and every tag has to be closed with a slash foo tag. If you inject just a slash foo tag, that is an XML syntax error, and it should create an error message. Um, if it doesn't create an error, then that means it's correctly not letting you inject these special characters. You can also try injecting that and see what happens. These are ways to see if the injection is getting in. Um, sometimes the XML parameters are stored. This is like we talked about stored SQL injection, where you store a name with an apostrophe in it, and then later on when you use that name, it creates SQL injection. So you can try various commands here that would try to inject the test into the database. Um, if you inject just one half of a comment or the other half of a comment, that ought to have a lot of disastrous results, causing a bunch of the requests to just be ignored, and that might be good, clean fun. This is sort of like the encryption technique we talked about a couple of chapters ago, where you just change one bit, and it's going to randomly change things, but those might get you into somebody else's account. So, you know, of course, the same old thing to prevent this, filter data at every stage, don't let people inject these special characters. Instead, HTML and L encode them when they come in so that you can put in a less than sign, but it's just interpreted as a character. Less than is not interpreted as a meta character, which begins an XML command. And then there's other ways to do this. Um, you can do HTTP redirection. This is some one of the many vulnerabilities of the Amazon uh, Hackazon server. Um, you have some page that goes to another page. Like in a Hackathon server, it's I think after you log in, it redirects to a page, and you can just put the URL in there, what page it goes to. Um, so you have user-controlled input, and so now in here, it's this variable called location. Location equals online blogs, and uh, you can change it. So you can cause the result of this request to go to a different location. So now you can send it to go to, say, at port 22, so you can tell it to probe an internal service, so you're going to be beyond the firewall. The firewall will normally only let you go to the web server. And there are things behind there that you'd like to mess with, like the database server and the domain controller, but you can't get there. So this way you can bounce things off the web server locally and see the result. It's one way of pivoting. So here I'm able to send a request to the SSH server, and I get the SSH banner, and then I get an error message, like I said at the start you're very often going to just see an error message because you're going to be tricking the server into producing the wrong kind of data, and it will not be accepted by the processors that's passing the data back to you. So this is a way to use an app as a proxy. You can also use apps to attack other apps. Um, there was a, there's a book called Silence on the Wire, which is pretty fantastic, that talks about how to attack a server without sending a single packet to the server. And one of his cool techniques is you go to your website, and you put links to the server you want to attack, but you don't click them. You wait for the Google bot to index your page and click those links. And then Google will attack the server for you and cache the results in the Google cache. And then you go look at the Google cache and they don't have any way to find out who you are. It's kind of brilliant. Anyway, the same kind of thing goes here. You can use other people's sites to attack people. Um, and here's parameter injection. The HT TP specifications do not tell you what to do if someone defines the same parameter twice. So here I have from account, amount to account, and submit. But what if I had the, I put in the from account twice? Um, well, this is, that's coming in a minute. Here we're just going to do injection. I'm just going to give it the cleared funds parameter, which shouldn't be there. And I'm going to inject it into an account number. So um, if I do this, I can just 
send in an account number ampersand cleared funds equals true by um, URL encoding this percent 26, which I think turns into the ampersand. That's the game. I can give it a number, which the first part of the app accepts as part of the number, but when it passes it on to the next part of the app, it's interpreted as a separate parameter. So now I've approved my own transaction. It's interpreted as an approved transaction and not an attack transaction. It has to be approved. It thinks the funds are cleared. So that's injecting parameters. And uh, the other one is parameter pollution, the one I was talking about before. If you define the same parameter twice, there are no rules about what should happen. So some people will just use the first one, some the last one, some will stick the two of them together, some will turn it into an array with multiple values. Lots of screwy things might happen. So that's good, clean fun. So here's the original thing, from account amount cleared funds equals false to account. So if I take from account here, and then um, I have cleared funds is true amount, and then I'm gonna have two copies of cleared funds. I put cleared funds equals false there, and then I add cleared funds equals true to mine, so now it will, um, it will just send two copies of that parameter to the server and I might have it cleared. There's one I defined and one the other one defined. Another thing you can do is you can often put the parameters up here in the URL like you would in a get and also down here in the post. You can put the same thing in both places and some servers will take one and some will take the other. So it's a, a cute trick. Um, one common technique used in Apache config files is URL rewriting. This is a terrible idea, and it's ubiquitous. It takes the input in the form of a URL and it rewrites it according to regular expression matching before it passes it on to the next device. So if you have things like REST style parameters where parameters look like they're in the file path, I don't know why people do these horrible things, but they do. So um, here's a mod rewrite is available in Apache just for this purpose. So this will take slash pub slash user slash Marcus and turn it into mode equals view, name equals Marcus. For some ungodly reason, you wanted rest, where you wanted to put parameters here, and you, and you wanted to have them interpreted as if they were here. So you can do this, and I think um, Drupal does this, and I think WordPress does this, I think almost all of them do this, and it's just asking for a kick in the teeth to do this. So here's the attack, I can put that is parameters there, and now it's going to do mode equals view name, but it's going to have another parameter there because this percent 26 was interpreted as part of this file name, and the file name didn't care about filtering out the ampersands because it's not bad in a file name. And when it, you brought, you put it in down here, it resolved the URL encoding and turned it back into an ampersand, so now I'm able to inject an extra parameter because it was, it was sanitized as a file name, but interpreted as a parameter later which is just like the line of data that was interpreted as a username and then later on interpreted as part of a SQL command. So the apostrophe changed from part of a name into a meta character. And you can inject SMTP and HTTP are both subject to splitting attacks. So if you have some kind of form where someone can send an email, like a feedback form, you have a problem, you can now submit a comment here. This goes to an email server and email servers just take lines of plain text, just like HTTP servers and HTTP requests. And so you can send it something here. And unfortunately, they're in stages. The first line will take the data. The next will just pass it on to the server. So for example, I could add a BCC. I could just put in a line feed and then a BCC here. And if it doesn't filter out the line feed character, I'm now allowed to add another line here. And this stuff that should have been interpreted as part of the first person's email address is interpreted as another header line, and now I can send spam from their server. But what's even more fun is this. Um, I can do command injection here. Um, this is a normal feedback request that creates this conversation, which is what you're supposed to do, and there's a period at the end to end it. But what I can do is inject a whole email into the subject field with percent zero D percent zero eight. Those are characters are in line feeds. So I inject a second whole email request inside the first one. And the only thing that discriminates it is the period here. So I can inject all of this. And now I have the normal feedback form and I inject a whole second email down here about cheap Viagra sending something off. I can now send spam from their server. I, because this happens the other way too in HTTP splitting, you can take a server's response and your browser will interpret it as two pages, not one. And your email server interprets this as two separate messages to send, not one. 
And this happens because you have one part that takes the data and lines it up, and then it passes it to the server, which tries to parse it, and the server, it doesn't remember that the same request sent two emails. It just has a request coming in, and then it has another server trying to process the emails as they come in that no longer really knows where they came from. All right, um, con men operate on the same principle. They talk to someone who doesn't understand the context. So they go to some poor junior worker and they say, I have a big important person. I was just having coffee with the boss and he told me I should get in this room. And that worker does not know who you are or really what the rules are. And it's the same thing here. The email server doesn't understand, doesn't have any clues to tell it that this should have been one message and not two. All right, so you're injecting every parameter. Um, the usual stuff, inject a few lines and see if they get in. So to prevent all this, of course, validate user supplied data. That's the message of everything here. But that's a whole lot harder than you might think it is. Um, all right, so I got a few cahoots about that. Let's get rid of this one and go on to 10B, which is here. Player versus player. I don't know quite what that is, but anyway. All right. What's going on? I'll tidy this up. There you go, that's a good idea. I see that happen now and then, yeah, yeah. It's a fair cop. If people manage to hack Kahoot, that would be awesome. The only attack I've seen is I've seen students that run a script and have like 100 extra names up there. That's kind of a DOS attack, it's not too exciting, but it does count. It's, uh, if you can find a way to totally cheat and win the Kahoots, that would be awesome. Oh yeah, I mean, that's another that's another DOS attack, and you know you can do that, but it's more fun if you could somehow win. That would be cool. All right, all right, I'll wait another few seconds. I think we're ready to go. All right. So which attack? That's the same value twice. That's parameter pollution, they call it. All right, which attack declares a custom doc type? That's XXE, XML, external entity. That's a very good question, and I really don't know the answer. I don't know how global it is. Um, that would determine its persistence. I don't know the answer. It'd be fun to play with. I know a couple of simple CTF problems I've done that had it, but I don't know how far it extends. Might continue until you reboot the server or something. That's a good, it'd be a fun question. It might just be an environment variable and only apply to your session. I'm not sure. Anyway, so which one uses HTML comments? Yep, that's the soap injection had that red text where you had to use comments to get rid of the extra pieces that you wanted to skip. And which one uses the app as a proxy? Yeah. 
Okay, that's HTTP redirection. All right, good. So I got Caitlin twice and Mateo twice, and I've got someone who's giving me fake names, so they're going to have to cough up a real name if they want their points. Aha, I see a chat message coming in. So let's see. Uh, here, chat message. All right. Ah, 10. Okay, good. I know who 10 is. All right. He's got three. 3T three will have to tell me who they are if they want their points. Other than that, I think um, I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to go upstairs and see if anyone wants help in the lab, but that's enough for one day. All right.